I'm Louis Lo. I'm a partner at Foley and Lardner in uh, Silicon Valley, and I'm delighted to uh, bring this group of folks to, to talk to you about a topic that is really top of mind for me as I try and get business done uh, for our clients here at Foley and Lardner. Uh, with me is uh, my partner, Ed Burbach. Uh, and Ben Dryden, and um, we're really honored to have uh, our client and who's someone who's become our dear friend, Deb Heights, who has um, really walked the walk um, in in this discussion about you know responding to the Federal Trade Commission and the Department of Justice in in this era, and and in fact um, in in several now. Um, so without further ado, I'm just going to ask uh, Ed, Ben, and, and Deb just to say a, a quick um, 30 seconds introduction of themselves. Ed? Great. So I'm Ed Burbach. I'm in Foley & Lardner's Austin, Texas office. Uh, I've been practicing law for about 35 years, I hate to say, but I chair our Government Solutions Practice Group, co-chair our State Attorney's General Practice and most relevant for this group, I used to run the litigation for the state of Texas when our current governor, Greg Abbott, was attorney general. So I've been handling consumer protection matters both before state AGs and the FTC now and private practice since I left the AG's office 20 years ago. Thank you, Ed. Ben, over to you. Hi, everyone. I'm Ben Dryden. I'm a partner in Foley's Washington, D.C. office. I'm the vice chair of our national antitrust and competition practice group. My personal practice focuses on antitrust issues that arise in mergers and acquisitions, as well as counseling with a focus on health care and labor employment issues, because we're seeing an increasing confluence between antitrust and labor and employment. Thank you, Ben. And, and Deb, uh, tell us about yourself. I'm Deborah Heiss. I'm co-CEO of a uh, multinational direct selling company named Neora, based here in the uh, Dallas area of Texas. And I, I think I'm on this call. Actually, I know I'm on this call because we just ended an eight-year fight with the FTC um, where we uh, defeated them and emerged victorious um, on all counts. And we're just so grateful to have you here, Deb. Thank you so much for joining. Um, for everybody who's joined us uh, through NACD, we'd be really grateful if you kept your cameras on. And we want to make this a conversation. And so please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature, I'm not sure which, uh, to, to jump in with your questions. And to the extent that it's directly relevant to what we're talking about, um, I'm I'm going to interrupt people and and, uh, and jump in with the questions, and then to the extent that it's it's not directly related, we'll we'll hope to have a few minutes at the end. So the way we're going to do this is we're going to start with Ed and and Deborah and really tell the story of Neora, um, which I think is really relevant to you know everyone's ability to to get business done. Uh, and then um, in, in the latter half of the program, we're going to explore a little bit um, the FTC's current um, views on mergers and acquisitions and how we get transactions done. Um, we're, there are some new pre-merger guidelines that are really important for directors to understand because the game has changed. Uh, and, and that's really um, why, we're, why we're here today. Um, Ed, do you want to kick us off with uh, setting the stage for what happened with Neora? Yeah, pleasure to do that. So June 2016, uh, one of our fine clients out of the Dallas area, Neora, uh, uh, I had done a presentation for them a few months previously. Basically, we do a little workshop, what to expect if the FTC or state AGs come knocking at your door. And it wasn't but eight months later that I had a call from the client that said we received a civil investigative demand, which is a civil subpoena, a subpoena from the FTC. And the extent of the CID was probably about 50 pages long. And without going into great detail, is basically turn over every single document you have. And we're going to do a complete, as New York referred to it as open the kimono review of your company. And so we spent three and a half years producing documents to the FTC. Uh, the case was run out of their Chicago office originally. Um, and that process was interesting. Once you learn very quickly, the FTC has a policy, and I'll tell you why I can call it a policy, um, that if they've decided that you've done something wrong, they are not going to show you the evidence. They consider that pre-suit discovery. So they'll come to you and say, you owe us X hundred million dollars. They may show you a draft complaint saying, if you do not settle with us, we are going to file this. And if 
for many companies, especially those in retail, that's a death knell to have a major federal agency claiming you're cheating your consumers. Um, and if you don't settle in the next few weeks, we're going to file this. Uh, and the reason why I can say that's their policy, I literally, and the reason I'm wearing a tie today, I just got off a hour long call with the head of the FTC's Consumer Protection Bureau, his name is Sam Levine. Uh, different company than you are, but another company, different industry, somewhat similar investigation. And they flatly refused once again an hour ago to give us the alleged evidence they have. And they said, if you don't settle in a week, we're referring you up to commissioners for a suit and, and you need to pay us an enormous amount of money. And, and that's the reality of what the FTC does. Very different than most state AGs. Certainly when I was in the Texas AG's office, we would have never done that. Uh, so that's what happened with Neora. And in a minute, Deb will give you the, the great details. But basically they came to Neora and they said, you must pay this huge amount of money. And by the way, you got to stop being the type of company you are. And if not, we're going to sue you. And most companies can't afford to fight them. And so what happens is um, you have a Hobson's choice. You can either capitulate and pay them a huge amount of money and then sign a stipulated order that's filed in court where you they do not allow you to deny the claims. If you settle with the FTC Consumer Protection Bureau, they require you to use their stock language, which says we will neither admit or deny these claims. And then there's some language that says, but for purposes of enforcement, we admit we did all these terrible things. They refuse to do anything but that language. So you're basically admitting, despite the facts, that you did awful things very publicly. So Neora, uh, and we'll get in, let Deb... Well, let's, let's zoom out a second, Ed. Just in a in a sentence, why is the FTC even there? Why are they knocking on your door? Maybe, maybe you and Deb should take that together. Deb, why don't you tell them why? We found out why. We did find out. Um, so ostensibly what brought them to our door is we had launched a product that... Um, we had a scientist talk about the product at a convention with several thousand people. And he said some things he shouldn't have said, even though we told him not to. And of course, you had a couple thousand people in a convention hall. They start tweeting what was said. And next thing you know, you're cleaning up social media for the next six months. By the way, which we did. Uh, and, and it largely cleaned up for the FTC knock. So ostensibly, that's why they knocked on our door. But the reality is, is there's an organization out there called the Truth in Advertising Organization that has a, a, a bee in its bonnet for direct selling companies and just believes our entire business model and business practice is bad. And they search and comb the internet for anything they can see that might be a, a, a claim. And they, they um, the director of that organization and Sam Levine are good, very good friends. And uh, they, they delivered the evidence and they knocked on our door with the presumption that because we were in the direct selling industry that we were automatically a pyramid scheme. Um, and this is without really doing any detail, really having e any analysis whatsoever. So that, you know, that's why they showed up. But the reality is, and this is a niche, and I know this doesn't apply to the majority of you on the call, so I want to be really brief. Um, there is, there was, there is a plan, there was a plan within the FTC to change direct selling. So speaking. Um, basically to um, eliminate the idea that you can ha have a company where somebody recruits another seller and gets paid on their sales. And they'd gotten another very large company to agree to that, that they were trying to force that down our throat. And their goal is to make our business model, which is where you make sales, you get paid and you recruit people and they get paid on their sales to be uh, de facto a pyramid scheme. And it's been very clear that that's their goal. They've actually not hidden that from us. But that's just simply not the law. I don't know if Ed, if there's anything else you would want to. Yeah, I would add one before. thing. The question is, how did they get on Tina's web uh, uh, radar? They actually won an award. Uh, oh, yeah, we won an award. The, yeah, from a leading, tr the leading trade association in the country honored several companies, and they happened to be honored. So therefore, the consumer advocacy group started an investigation of them because they won an award. Amazing. So, pro tip for directors out there. Companies will be responsible for what is said about them by consultants that are hired to, to or that are on the payroll to talk about uh, the quality of the company's products. 
Uh, and pro tip number two, uh, to, to, to resolve that really, what is your compliance program to make sure uh, that, that, uh, that things like that don't happen? And if they do, um, to Deb's point, how do you clean it up? And how do you how do you have evidence of that, um, Deb? I'm just curious. Did you consider self-reporting, or you know, was that just the furthest thing from your your thoughts at that point that you would be um, you know in front of the FTC? Were, were there looking back in time, were there things that could have been done, or that you know, if it were to happen now, you would do to avoid the FTC knocking on your door and coming after you in the way they well, did? There's been some some developments that would change that pathway in our industry. We've developed a self-reporting agency and a, uh, a it's called the direct selling self regulatory agency that did not exist uh, prior. So now we would probably let them know, hey, we're aware we have this problem. We're working on cleaning it up. However, um, one point that you said that was really critically important. In fact, uh, the judge in our case cited it everywhere. We have a robust compliance program. We got on top of the claims that were made immediately. We told people to take them down. Um, she commended our compliance program. It's independent of our executive team. We terminate sellers. We, we do everything we're supposed to do to make sure that we stay within compliance with education and all of that stuff. So one of the reasons we won our case um, was that we do have robust compliance that when somebody does make a mistake, we have a a method to deal with it that is uh, documented and and you know tracked. Well, thank you, Deb. I'm curious to know, and I think it would be relevant for directors to know. Um, once an investigation starts, how how long after it starts do you find out about it, and how long does this investigatory process last? Well, you know, it depends on how you're being investigated. So we, when the investigation started. I'm sure there was some pre-investigation. We knew. I mean, when they showed up with the CID, we knew. There are other companies that I know of that they found out when their doors were locked. I mean, uh -huh. it's just the way the FTC works. And then you end up fighting a receiver to get back control of your company. And it, it's ugly. Um, so the well, FTC the FTC will tell you that's egregious violators. But some of those companies have won those cases. So that's not necessarily the case. Uh, once wow. you start, once you start the investigation, we did 16 document productions and spent about three and a half years, including meeting with staff in both Washington, DC and Chicago, the office that filed the complaint Wow! before we ever met with the commissioners. And when you meet with the commissioners, I have to say it's a rubber stamp. I mean, they, they, they're taking their staff guidance and they're going forward, um, based off staff recommendations. I don't feel like uh, but, even though we met with them, we had any voice at all. And, and at, at what point does the investigation become public? Um, when they file. Now, we're a privately held company. Mm -hmm. So I can say that as a public company, that is probably not the case. The, mm. you have to, you're going to have to disclose that you received a CID when you receive the CID. Mm -hmm. And and because there's a risk associated with that. And I don't think as a public company, you could keep that private. So you said something really important that I think might have been lost on on folks that don't know the Neora story as well as those of us here on this call. Um, and that's that once it's rendered public and either you're a public company and you're disclosing it in your Q or your K um, or your private company and it's not really being disclosed until there's a public filing. What happens? Um, you know, what is your bank say? What do your suppliers say? What do your creditors say? Um, is that, what do they think about that? So we're, we're, a, we're a global company at the time we were operating in, I think, 16 different markets. Mm -hmm. um, they sued us. We got ahead. Of, actually, we mm -hmm. sued them first. I do need to say that. We uh, felt like they were trying to use uh, activity, uh, you know, <laughs> regulatory activity to change the law. So we sued them for that reason. They sued us back, not surprisingly, the same day. Mm -hmm. um, but once the case became public, we let all of our sales rep know why we were fighting. Basically, we were fighting to protect their income because if we if we'd adopted the FTC stance that the only person that can make a commission on the sale of something, and I'm talking about direct selling, but you got to think real estate, you got to think insurance. You know these commissions tree up. Um, that the only person who can make a commission was the person selling it that would have taken our full-time sales reps income, you know, to 5% of what they were making or 10% of what they were making. 
Wow. So they knew why we, yeah, they knew why we were fighting. So that helped us. But once it became public, within 30 days, we received a letter from um, Bank of America, which was our worldwide treasury bank and did probably 80% of our credit card processing, mm -hmm. saying we had 60 days to get out. Oh, my gosh. The owner got the same letter. So imagine you have an FTC case in hand and you've got to go find new banking and new merchant processing in 60 days. We were able to negotiate that to a whopping 90 days. And what were the conversations that you had with other banks and where did you land? Well, the conversation we had, let me start with Bank of America itself. The, the entire rationale was it was a reputational risk for the bank. I'm certain they have no banking relationships with any other company that's involved with the federal government, right? So we were suddenly, <laughs> suddenly a reputational risk. Yeah. Um, and the and as a direct selling company, uh, we will acknowledge that there are there have been bad players in our industry. We're we're not one of them, um, or anywhere close to one of them. And there are many that are very good, but there's already a bit of a reputational taint when you walk in the door. It was very difficult for us to get banking, especially in the United States. Um, our law firm, uh, Mr. Burbach, spent a lot of time on calls with banks and, and merchant processors and explaining our case and what we thought we would win. And we l eventually landed at a bank that handles cannabis companies in the United States. So our fees went up, our merchant processing fees went up, our return rates are less than 1%. Mm -hmm. So we are not a credit card risk, um, but everything got vastly more expensive. Uh, suppliers changed terms. You know, the assumption is net 30 isn't very good if you're out of business 30 days later. So we suddenly lost lines of credit with suppliers. We Our, our terms got changed. We ended up in a lot of cash up front situations. In addition to the overall legal costs, it was extraordinarily expensive and it was really kind of down to the wire whether or not we'd be able to continue processing sales for a period of time but we managed to do that um deb tell us about what happened to the company's business after this got announced and let's specifically revenues if you can comment on that uh absolutely um our revenues from the time it was announced till the time uh we got the verdict and we just got the verdict in september of this year or last year um, dropped, I'm going to do some quick math in my head. I should know this off the top of my head. Uh, it's too painful to think about. Um, but let's say 60%. Okay. So um, attracting one of these uh, publicly disclosed FTC investigations can be fatal to your business is, is really what I'm hearing. But Deb, kudos to you that you, you, kept, it, you kept it alive. And, and tell us where you are today. I'm at the office. <laughs> oh, sorry. I meant I, that was a softball to say we're thriving. No, I know we're doing fine. We're 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 doing fine. Um, you know, there's other economic pressure, the pandemic. Keep in mind, all this is going on during the pandemic and everything else. Everybody was suffering. I do want to I do want to point out one other thing. As a um, company whose bread and butter is selling products through distributors, and the distributors are are voluntary salespeople. They they pay a whopping $20 for the privilege of being a salesperson. It's not like, you know, whatever you have in your vision, you have in your head, I pay $20. I can now post this product on my Instagram and receive 20% commission every time somebody buys it. It's that simple. And then if I get somebody else to do that, I can receive 3% of what they sell. Just think along those terms. But for a company whose bread and butter is recruiting salespeople to ultimately expand our sales force so that we can sell more product to end users. On Facebook, so many people see it on my account, so many people see it on somebody else's account. So that's the methodology with which we sell. They First thing you saw when you searched Neora on Google was FTC accuses Neora of being a pyramid scheme. Because the government's Google rights and Google, when the Google places priority priority on articles. The government far exceeds anything you can do. So one of our biggest causes of sales decline, our customer base stayed around. We had natural attrition. We know a customer lasts X number of months and that didn't really change. It was the ability to get new customers because we couldn't get new salespeople uh, during that time frame. Because when somebody signed up to sell and then their mom searched Neora, they say, oh, you just joined a pyramid scheme. They never made that post on Facebook to sell those three bottles of product or 
three lash extenders or whatever it is they were going to buy. Right. Um, so there was some evidence that they thought that they had and they weren't going to tell you. And did you eventually <laughs> find out what this evidence was? No, no, um, no. We sat in a we sat in with the, with the commissioners and they started reading something saying this and this. And the facts were wrong to us, by the way, what they're reading, the facts are wrong. And we're like, can we see that? And their answer was, no, you will see it when we file the case. They filed the case. We said, can we see it now? They said, no, it is part of our deliberative process. So whatever evidence they used to make their decision that they presented to the commissioners, to this day, we have not seen it. This is like a Kafka novel. Yeah. It sounds like <laughs> the accused. Um yeah. Well, Louie, not... as I said, literally an hour ago, the head of the C uh, the FTC's Consumer Bureau repeated that to me literally an hour ago, completely different industry. So mm -hmm. not direct selling at all. But he literally said, we will not show you this evidence uh, we have. Now, in the litigation in New York, uh, we had a fight over that, as you can imagine. And we eventually got a federal court order because our case was in federal court in Dallas mm -hmm. uh, for them to require to produce two people. They refused to produce anybody to testify on behalf of the FTC at all. We we won that battle. And then secondly, their in-house economist who had been doing this alleged analysis, they fought us tooth and nail. We got a court order. And when we were able to get a court to order him to turn over his computer code, within his own, this is economist at the FTC, who apparently came up with this great analysis initially before they handed it out to the testifying expert. Within that uh, computer code were his notes. And I know a lot of people here from California are probably more adept than I at programming. He actually included his notes that would include such statements as, I don't understand these 1.8 million records, so I'm just going to throw them out. That was literally in his computer codes and his notes. It was that outrageous. And they literally knew, and we had a phenomenal expert, uh, Dr. Walter Vandela, where he had shared his entire economic analysis as early as 2018 with the FTC, he used to work at the FTC, and they couldn't poke any holes in it. But even knowing, based on our data, that this company was not a pyramid scheme, they still filed suit. They just didn't care. Um, Ed, when you were Deputy Attorney General for litigation, would you have brought a case like this? I mean, what's changed in the law? What's changed in, in the tactics? It's, it's just a different tactic. So the FTC, and it confirmed an hour ago, this is their internal policy. They will not show you. The mm. CFPB, the same thing. You may know Commissioner Shoper used to be the FTC. Now he's in charge of the CFPB. Within the state attorneys general, I can speak obviously for Texas and many others that I know very well. They would show you, right? And here, let me give you a scenario. And I, this is literally from an hour ago. So it's very hot off the press. One of the arguments you can make is, listen, if you sell to consumers, for example, you say you have all this great evidence that we have been harming all these consumers, mm. but you won't give it to us. Mm. So what you're saying is, and you've got such a high demand that nobody with fiduciary duties can recommend to a board, and this is a publicly traded company, to settle this amount. So you are ensuring that we're going to have to fight you. And that fight will take at least four years. So all these terribly harmed consumers for four years because you refused to tell us who they even are and we could refund their money if we did anything wrong. Mm -hmm. You choose to not disclose that. So for four years, you know for a fact they're going to continue being harmed for four years. I literally just had that uh, court uh, conversation with that. And he said, yes, we're going to just push forward. And so that's one thing that most people outside of the Beltway and DC don't understand on the consumer side, that they are not going to, in the short term, help those consumers at all, even if they think they have fabulous evidence. They're not going to give it to you. So you sued the FTC. Mm -hmm. How long did this, and they sued you back, how long did this case uh, survive in court? And did it settle? Did it go to a jury trial or bench trial? What happened? It was a bench trial. Um, we spent about six to eight months arguing about venue. So the Chicago office came after us, uh, was the office that filed. We're in Dallas. Um, we sued them in Chicago. They sued us in New Jersey. 
they were forum shopping and then they accused us of forum shopping. So it took a while to get it settled in Dallas. And it went to a uh, bench trial, um, a fabulous judge here locally. Um, and uh, she was very, very considerate, looked at all the evidence, very detailed, understood it was very much understood the case. Um, and so between November 1st of uh, 2019 through September 28th of 2023 is how long it was public. The trial itself took two weeks. Wow. And and it was September of 23 then that you got the you got the final verdict in your well, favor. Yes. We actually went to trial in November of or October of 20. October. Yeah. Yeah. Took 11 months. Uh, and our judge, Judge Barbara Lynn, is brilliant. She was the chief judge of the Northern District Texas Federal Court, but she certainly was not a conservative judge. She was a Clinton appointee, and uh, so certainly not some right-wing judge that just didn't like the federal government at all. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, those of us here in Northern California are, are uh, not always very right-wing at all. Um, so, <laughs> not your she. Um, um, and I, I, I wanted to kind of check you out a little bit on on our comments about the FTC and, and the judges and so forth. What is their explanation? And this is a, a good question from Amy Schenken in the chat. What is their explanation for their approach and why they don't have to provide evidence and why they don't have to tell you what they're doing and why they can essentially kill your business um, without any due process? Well, I will tell you what they've literally told us, so you don't even have to take it from me. So just an hour ago, uh, the commissioner, the director of Consumer Protection Bureau told us that we don't share information because that would be pre-suit discovery. Mm -hmm. So therefore, we're not going to tell you what you did wrong. And since you have all the information, you know what you did wrong. Uh, I will tell you one of the, currently there are, five commissioners of the FTC, which they're supposed to have five. Mm -hmm. Up until two weeks ago, there were three. Two just added. Mm -hmm. uh, one of them is Commissioner Slaughter. She used to be Chuck Schumer's chief of staff. I I took her comments being the most honest of anybody when we met with the commissioners with Neora before they filed suit. She literally said to us, we have a moral duty to bring lawsuits even though we know we will lose. And of course, I said, I'm just a lawyer. I've got a moral duty to follow the law. But that, I thought that was very useful because they see their role at the FTC as if they don't have a statute that they can rely upon that says what the law is, the FTC Act intentionally, especially Section 5, is written very vaguely. And so they want to push the limits and they call it fencing in. And so what they'll do is they'll be very, very aggressive because they want to move an industry. So what they'll say is, and they've told us this, that if they get companies to settle with injunctive terms that aren't required by the law, but if they get them to settle, then they show them to the industry and say, see, this is what your competitors are doing. You better move to what they're doing, or we may be looking at you also. I, th I think it's it's a tactic, it's a strategy, and, and they're very open about it, frankly. Um, what was the final results of the trial, Deb? Uh, we won on all. We won on all uh, counts. Um, it was about as complete. Well, not about as complete. It was as complete a victory as you could expect. Well, um, did they give you the lost revenue back? Did they give yeah. you your customers back? Did they give you your no? Back? Fact, no, no. In fact, we are in a. Uh, we filed another lawsuit. Um, there's a statute under which you can reclaim some of your attorney's fees, mm. uh, but you have to prove that they had no cause to bring the action, which is a little bit dicey. Um, but uh, if we were to prevail, we could recover about a little less than a fourth of what we spent. And that's just out-of-pocket expenses. The revenue is gone, as you would expect. I mean, we, we, we probably cost us hundreds of millions in revenue, um, yeah. and it's just gone. I, I, um, I just, my heart goes out to you. Um, you know, for those of us on the call here, we're, we're the National Association of Corporate Directors and we're looking to learn, um, you know, how, how to be better directors. I, I believe New York is a closely held company. I'm not sure that you had a board of directors as this was all going on. I, I suppose it's the owner. Yes. Um, and so for purposes of, um, you know, our discussion, I'll say that the owner is the board of directors. 
Um, how did you manage, um, you know, this this whole process for the owner? I mean, you're the CEO, and I'm I'm assuming the owner is not doing the day to day business here. And and you know, how often are you getting them together and keeping them apprised? These owners and and um, you know how 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 much were they involved? Well, our owner was named in the lawsuit, so he was he was named as a co defendant in the lawsuit. So he was extraordinarily involved in uh, in all of this, these aspects. We did not involve him in directly interfacing with the FTC at any point. Um, we felt like, particularly being a named um, a named defendant, that was a bad idea. Uh, by the way, his bank accounts also got shut down by Bank of America, and he got kicked out, and his brokerage account got frozen. And how about yours? All sorts, all sorts of things happened. Did they they hit yours too? They did not because I wasn't named. They they confined the people that were named. And yes, I do bank with Bank of America. So I was holding my breath a little bit there. <laughs> but uh, they hit they hit his. I think in uh, many of these cases, they do go after. I know in a similar case, the CEO was named. Yeah. Lawsuit. Um, I was fortunate. Well, I came on board two months after two months before it was filed. So I was not visible to them at the time. Um. um I, I have to think, ask you, Deb, what was the effect on your life? Oh, you know, it's extraordinarily stressful. Uh, yeah. I don't think you realize how stressful it is till you're done. Yeah. Because um, it's not just you. It's all your employees, all your salespeople, everything, you know, livelihood of a lot of people are involved in this. It, uh, uh, you know, I think Jeff, our owner, probably didn't sleep for three years and his his uh, his personal livelihood, all all that he's built. This is not his first company. Everything he built was at risk um, as a result of this. Uh, the whole company was at risk. And so knowing that every day, you have to go in and do it uh, and do what you need to do and keep moving forward. But you also have to recognize you're trying to run a business and there's a lot of other things and decisions you have to make. Um, we had to run the most conservative business possible because mm -hmm. the last thing you want to do is show up in court with new evidence. Um it was a bit crazy. Uh, I would like to answer two of the questions that are in the site that are in the chat, if you don't mind real quick. Oh, yeah, sure, please. Um, one is just anecdotal. Uh, somebody asked, what's Truth in Advertising done? Well, recently, Truth in Advertising um, put up an article saying that they found illegal claims from every member of the Direct Selling Association, except for one, I think, on their website. Um, these illegal claims when we looked at what they supposedly allegedly found for us, it's along the same lines of what they were claiming was illegal before. It's that we provide a supplemental income opportunity. That uh -huh. is the illegal claim that they are saying is illegal. And it's because most people don't make money. What they mean by that is most people are actually customers. But that, it, so they are just as aggressive. They are just as aligned with the FTC. This is in line with what the FTC wants to change about our industry. They don't, really don't want us to provide a business opportunity within our structures. Um, so they are extremely aggressive after us. Um, and then the other one, what changes approach behavior do we expect from the FTC after this loss? Okay. Well, the uh, person who is over the di division or the part that works for Sam Levine, her name is Lois Greisman, just rescinded um, some staff advisory letters that were used to defend us in court. And she is uh, full of uh, vitriol and out there saying that the judge got it wrong and that we are still harming people, even though they lost the case, did not appeal. Um, I do not see any changes, at least towards our industry of the FTC, other than trying to make sure that they've got um, a little less uh, you know, a little more opinion in uh, in their favor. She issued a new letter saying that what the old letter said was good is now not good. Um, so I do think that they are trying to recast what their interpretation of the law is. Of course, they've got, what, 70 years of law fighting against them, Ed, on that one. Yeah, and it's interesting that staff advisory opinion was from 2004. That's a 20-year-old advisory that they are running from now. The other thing I will say that with regard to truth and advertising, I had the pleasure of taking the deposition of the executive director. Her name's Bonnie Patton. And I spent a day with her and her strategy is to literally attack companies. And what they'll do is if, if you're having a major meeting and, and it's for any industry, I mean, they look at all kinds of advertising, they will use social media tools 
to tweet out or use other social media tools criticizing your company while you were either issuing big press or a big meeting as a tactic to come after you. Uh, that is literally what they do. And they are now, I think, the number two referral source to the FTC. So if you ever go on their website, it's tina.org. You can see many, many different industries that they're attacking with regard to advertising. And they don't consider state laws at all. They only have three lawyers in their entire organization, and they interpret what FTC law means. And my favorite was, I asked her one of the main uh, terms that was at issue in the law. I asked her, can you define that for me? And she said, it's a mosaic. So it's whatever they think it is, basically. So it's it's a little frightening, but no, they haven't lessened their behavior. And on the FTC side, Sam Levine came out and said, just because we lost to Neora, we are still going to aggressively go after and file lawsuits. He, he said that, again, as recently as an hour ago. Wow. Well, you know, I've, I've got to ask you, Ed, what advice do you have for boards of directors to make sure that their management is doing the right things to stay out of the FTC's focus? Thank you, Samesh, for your question. It's very interesting to me. It obviously depends on your industry, and it depends upon what you're well, We had 23andMe got shut down by the FTC a few years ago. Right? That's right. So you know, this and so, is not a foreign thing to Silicon Valley. This has happened here. Well, one of the things that we think is very useful is to be ready. And obviously, if you have robust compliance departments, legal departments, that's important. But it's also just a process people aren't accustomed to. So it's very useful to sit down with your C-suite, your staffers, um, uh, your legal department compliance and really go through an exercise of what do we do if we get these th a CID? Who is responsible for responding to the request? And we've seen many different ones. We actually put together kind of a, a, a on real CID stock in the FTC, very uh, specific questions they have asked numerous times. Who's gonna go get these documents? Who is responsible for maintaining these documents? Who's going to put the litigation hold on? Uh, what happens when the bank uh, cuts off uh, your banking accounts? You can't process credit cards. I think that's something that you can do on the front end, just be ready. And so when it happens, it's it's not a uh, shock to your system and you're not running in circles. I think that's really, really important. I think it's very important to control if you happen to be in retail Look at your BBB rankings. I mean, people tell me all the time they think that's silly, but BBB is the number one referral source to the FTC and many state AGs. So if you have a bad rating, you have a lot of consumer complaints, that's usually because companies just don't respond to the BBB when they reach out to them. It's incredibly important to respond to them, try to get back with them, because if not, that very quickly turns into a state AG or FTC investigation. So I think I just heard another pro tip, which we'll note here in our follow-ups, that um, directors should ask uh, the general counsel uh, whether anybody's monitoring complaints with the Better Business Bureau and the rate of response uh, to those to those comments. That's uh, that's really good, Ed. Thank you. Um, I'm going to wrap up um, this first segment on consumer uh, protection at the FTC with just a final question for. Uh, Deb, well, I can't help myself. What was it like to testify in federal court, Deb? <laughs> I think I was well prepared. Our attorneys did a great job. But yeah. also, um, I think our entire team did a great job of testifying. I have two, th two words of advice to anyone who's faced the FTC. You may be thinking settlement. They're thinking, how do I bully you to get what I want? And what they want may not be your acknowledgement that you did something wrong. We were early on, we were early on willing to say, hey, yeah, we had a product complaint problem. Let's just resolve that. We'll pay a fine on the sales of that product. And that was not what they were interested in. Um, the other thing was we we gave them every piece of evidence and we didn't fight it. I don't think that would have mattered. It might have taken longer if we'd have fought and said, oh, we don't want to. But when we got to federal court, we were, and actually really from day one, we were convinced that we were right. So testifying was easy. When you think you're right and you have the facts to back it up, you just want to share that story. So it was it was actually a cathartic and wonderful experience. Um, anything you would have done differently, Deb? 
You know, I I don't know that we would have. Um, you know, I, we've contemplated this a lot. Probably the only thing that I would have done a little more aggressively is told our story a little more broadly before it got to the point that the case was filed. But by then it was really, we always thought it was going to go away. We always thought they were going to find nothing. Um, we were naive enough to think that they were looking at the evidence. Uh, Ed referred to a document. It, it was clear that they never looked at the evidence. They came in with the idea that we were guilty and everything was built around how do I prove your guilt as opposed and, to what's really going on here? And, and Samash is asking what the FTC was really after. And I think they were just trying to shut you down, right? The FTC is really after killing multi-level marketing in general, which is what we are. We're a multi-level marketing company. And that just simply means that when I sign up a salesperson and they make a sale, I get paid. They sign up a salesperson, I get paid on them too. Their goal is to shut down direct selling and multi-level marketing. And it's, it's not... I think it was fairly transparent early on to the point that we went to the trade association. Their reaction was that can't be what it is. But like Ed today, I was on a call with the trade association earlier about this rescinding of letters. And it's become pretty clear to everybody that that is their goal to not offer a business opportunity to independent contractors. They just, that's their goal. They've, they've got a vision of what they think our industry is in their head. They're wrong. And it's unfortunately a small enough industry that there's only two or three players at the FTC that pay attention to us on a regular basis. And yeah, if, I can, if I can, Louie, I'd add the timing when you're now, as we sit here in an election year, a presidential election year, and you may know that one of the big disputes in the election is why are consumer prices so high? And so the FTC has an incentive to have an explanation why consumer price is so high. So they are being very aggressive right now. And as I said, I just experienced this an hour ago of trying to at least announce lawsuits and file suits that the theme of the reason the prices are so high is because these companies are cheating. It just is. And that, that made very clear on the call we had an hour ago. The facts really didn't matter. Uh, and one thing, Deb mentioned the economist, the in-house economist at the FTC. He literally told us the data does not matter. Now, how can you be an economist and say that? It's because the lawyers are driving, even at the FTC, they're driving the decisions and they're, they're telling the economists what to do. That's the reality. And especially in an election year like this year, it's on steroids right now. Well, Ju Julie Kavana Jerbic asked a really good question in the chat, um, is that now that these actions, um, whether they emanate from inside the FTC or from a customer or a shareholder, it's become process rather than uh, the exception. What advice do we have to directors once this is on the foreground? It's the complaint's been made, the investigation has begun. Um, what advice would we have them, would we share with them at that point? And I, I think um, Deb shared a lot of really helpful comments about demonstrating the prowess of the compliance function. Um, but, you know, if if you don't have one and uh, you're at this point, it might be a little too late to um, to do that. Other advice, uh, Deb or Ed, about what directors can do once this this uh, the FTC comes knocking? From my point of view, it's important to control expectations, because I think in Deb can correct me if I'm wrong or the client I was dealing with today and many clients we've had. If you haven't dealt with the FTC before, you just don't believe this happens. You just don't think that they'll just ignore the evidence and they won't share it with you and they'll try to squeeze money out of you. Most people outside the Beltway in D.C. just don't understand that that's the reality. That's what they do. So I think as a director, it's going to be very incumbent upon you to make sure that the folks in your company understand that they have different goals than a normal normal litigant. They don't pay their lawyers by the hour. They've got a relatively big staff. And if they lose, big deal. At least they tried to protect consumers. I think that is something that most people are involved in private litigation don't understand. And it's a big distinction when you're dealing with the government. Yeah. I would I would second that. I think that our mistake early on was thinking that surely they're going to look at the evidence and this is going to go away before we ever get to do the uh, case being filed. And there was never an indication 
even though we believed it was going to happen, they gave us no indication that was ever going to happen. And Ed didn't either, by the way. But right from the start, if they're at the, your door with the CID, they're going to get their pound of flesh or they're going to try. Very helpful. Well, thank you so much. We're going to switch gears now and we're going to talk about the world of M&A, uh, which is also uh, uh, vastly impacted by policy and um enforcement at the Federal Trade Commission in Washington, D.C. And with us, who's been very quiet and patient, is my partner, Ben Dryden. And Ben um, is among a small elite group of partners in our firm that prepare every single merger acquisition transaction uh, for reporting to the FTC or the DOJ and um, shepherds those transactions through the process until they're approved. Um, ben, um, I don't need to tell you that M&A activity was enormous in 2021 and then kind of has been falling off a cliff uh, ever since uh, to yet another cliff and another cliff. Um, yesterday, you know, we had a, a really positive um, readout from the FTC that we hope to have three interest rate drops uh, in the rest of the year, which, you know, we hope might have some impact uh, on, on M&A activity and helping it pick back up again. But um, I'm not sure that the FTC thinks that M&A activity is good at all. And I wondered if you could share with us really what's driving the uh, the, the policy over at FTC in terms of tightening uh, the restrictions and what is their uh, scope of action, if you will, what's their goal. And, and I always thought about the FTC as protecting competitive markets, making sure that we're, we're all not subject to one monopoly telephone company or one monopoly electric company. And it, now it seems like the game has changed. I've thrown a lot at you, Ben. I'll let sure. you start the conversation. Sure. Well, I, I think the way you ended it really helps to explain where the FTC is coming from. The, this idea that their job is to prevent there from being monopolistic markets. They they speak in exactly those terms. They, uh, the current FTC leadership uses the word the anti-monopoly movement. We, we are uh, moving forward the anti-monopoly movement. And their perspective, and it's, you know, I don't personally agree with it, but I do see where they're coming from. They look back over the past 40 plus years of antitrust enforcement. And what they see is in the glass half full that we've gone from an economy where there wasn't an internet 40 years ago to where we are today. What they see is the glass half empty, that there is more consolidation in industry. There's less small business formation. It is harder if you are a small entrepreneur to go from a startup to a, a, a big successful uh, enterprise, that's at least their perspective. And so the, the people who are leading the FTC and the DOJ today really take that as their mantle. They say that if we enforce the antitrust laws as they were originally intended, we will make it easier and fairer for small businesses and workers and the you know, historically disadvantaged segments to get a fair shake. And so, they, they are firm believers in that, and they, they are being very, very active in pursuing that agenda. And so there are a number of things they are doing in the merger space. Mm -hmm. the, the, uh, in, in the past year, I think they've done three really, truly game-changing things in the area of merger enforcement. The headline was, in December, they released new merger guidelines, which are the document that lay out how the Federal Trade Commission, the DOJ, will review mergers uh, in an antitrust review. And they, it, it was a complete rewrite. It was the most thorough rewrite of the merger guidelines of, of all time. I mean, they they didn't even use the same model. And I, you know, I, I applaud them. But there are some smart people at the FTC, and they're they're saying our audience is in courts. Our audience is the business community. Our audience is the public. So they they really wrote the merger guidelines in a more user friendly lay uh, language. And they just begin with uh, a pretty interesting uh, line that a merger that a, a horizontal merger, a merger between competitors, it results in a combined market share above thirty percent. Presumptively anti-competitive is their position. And I've had clients ask, "Well, how do, how can they do that? How can they just change the law?" And well, they can't change the law. But what they did is they point to a Supreme Court decision from nineteen sixty three very, very early in the age of modern merger enforcement, where the Supreme Court in 1963 said that a horizontal merger results in a combined market share above 30% is presumptively anti-competitive. 
So they're saying that's the law of the land that has never been overturned. Uh, and as a practical matter, they're they're right. That has not been overturned. That is the law of the land. It's just for the past 45 years or so, the agencies have just been more sophisticated than that. And they haven't tried to apply that holding of the Supreme Court to ban mergers. So that's how the new merger guidelines begin. But then they take uh, they, they go in some interesting places. They say, we're not only going to look at what's good for consumers, we're also going to look at what's good for, for workers. And for the past four decades, if you could show that a merger resulted in cost savings for the merging companies in the form of reducing uh, expenditure on labor, you would usually say, well, that's a synergy. We're we're making our combined organization more efficient. We'll be able to pass some or all of those savings along to consumers. That's a good thing. That's making markets more competitive. The new position out of the agencies is no, that's lessening competition in the marketplace for competing for talent. So it's a, it's a novel application of the antitrust laws, but they've had some uh, success in getting courts to accept that at least as a premise of antitrust enforcement. So that that's the biggest development in the past year, these new merger guidelines. But they've done some other things in individual enforcement cases that are really, really important. And arguably the biggest one is for the first time since the Jimmy Carter administration, the federal government has won a vertical merger challenge, a litigated vertical merger challenge. It was the Illumina Grail case where Illumina, Illumina makes uh, next generation gene sequencing uh, machines and Grail is a company that makes the test strips. So I'm picturing test strips that go to the machines that uh, Illumina makes. And Grail is the only company that makes those things, but there are other companies that are trying to develop them. Well, Illumina used to own Grail. They spun it off a few years ago. They then realized their mistake and said, no, let's buy it, let's buy it back. And so they were trying to buy this company that they had previously owned. And the FTC said, sorry, you spun it off. It's a new company now. And we're concerned that if Illumina, the monopoly manufacturer of these next generation gene sequencing machines, owns the supplier of the test strips, then that's going to make it hard, harder for other companies to develop test strips. And no one else is currently making the test strips, but some people are trying. And it was a fascinating uh, litigation and uh, Ed and Deb were talking about the, the rubber stamp at the FTC. Well, rubber stamp what the uh, uh, what, what their uh, uh, staff has, has said. It, it's even more pernicious than that. The FTC authorized suing Illumina and Grail. They litigated before an administrative law judge. The administrative law judge ruled for the parties. They know the FTC is wrong. This deal is not going to lessen competition. And then the FTC sat as a court of appeals above its own administrative law judge and said, no, we agree with ourselves. The complaint that we authorize, we are persuaded by. So we overturned the administrative law judge's decision. And then only at that point do you get to go to an actual independent court, but you're doing so under a deferential standard of review. The Fifth Circuit largely deferred to the factual findings of the Federal Trade Commission. And what we're left with is a opinion of the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals that found that a vertical merger is less in competition. We haven't seen that since the Carter administration. So that's game changing. Uh, doesn't seem unreasonable, though. Um, I even, get where they're coming. Who's, who's uh, you know, pr pretty critical of, of what the FTC has done to M&A markets. And, you know, just to put that in perspective, the the whole ecosystem here in Silicon Valley really depends on M&A being an, an exit opportunity for a startup. And as we all know, sometimes that's an aqua hire where, you know, the buyer of the company just essentially pays back the investors what they put in and hires the team and gets the technology. We call that an aqua hire. And then uh, early 21, I think it was one of Lena Khan's first actions, maybe it was 22, um, where she subpoenaed all the large tech companies on the non-reportable transactions below the threshold that are not required to be uh, uh, reported, and she issued subpoenas to Microsoft and Google and Apple and Amazon. And since then, you know, you don't see them doing many acquisitions in the market. And that really has a chilling effect on a venture capitalist's appetite to write a check to a startup because that VC, you know, can't really have much faith that there is, there is a, maybe a, a, a reasonable uh, exit possibility in case the company doesn't hit a home run. 
um, which yeah. we see a lot of. Then, then you get, um, you know, the the opportunity to consolidate, and you just, you know, nobody can get anywhere near a transaction like that nowadays. And then finally, you have big companies like Amazon uh, trying to do, you know, trying to develop new technologies and in, in new industries to really go outside. Um, and I'm thinking about iRobot, and they were blocked, right? Tell us about that transaction, Ben. So the iRobot deal, uh, it, it was blocked out of Europe. It, the, the FTC didn't get to the point where it had to go to court. They were prepared to go to court. Um, it, it's a interesting deal. I mean, Amazon did for a moment consider making a home robot, but they weren't a serious competitor in the market for robot vacuums. But it's under this lens, uh, it's the same theory that the, the FTC has developed and that now uh, the Fifth Circuit has agreed with in the Luna Grail case, that if a buyer is going to acquire a target and thereby gain the ability and the incentive to disadvantage that target's rivals, that's the mechanism of harming competition. And there, there just hasn't been any case law to support that theory for 45 years, and now there is. It's a Fifth Circuit opinion. So it, it really is a different way of approaching merger analysis. And you're looking much beyond uh, traditional horizontal mergers between competitors. You're, you're, you're thinking more holistically and you know, thinking two and three and four strategic steps ahead. Might this buyer change its business model now that its incentives are different? Um, I think we're we're running out of time, but I, I have one last question for you, Ben, and and uh, I'm sure folks can follow up with you with their questions if if we don't get to them all. But you know, for our audience of directors here, what is really important for them to know if uh, if they're if an M and A transaction is even on the horizon? And specifically, I'm thinking about a four C. What do they need to know about four C documents? And then two, um, what do they need to know about interlocking directorates? <laughs> Yeah, it'll be hard to unpack this in a minute, but I'll, I'll try. So the FTC is considering a rulemaking that will dramatically, dramatically expand the, the burden and the, the requirements to complete a Hart Scott Rodino form, which is the form that you make when you submit a deal of valued above $119.5 million. The proposal that's on the table is you'll have to submit not only the documents that talk about competition that were prepared for the deal process, but you'll have to collect some documents that talk about competition that weren't done for the deal process, ordinary course business plans. You'll also need every single draft of one of those documents if one of those drafts was shared with an officer or a director, mm -hmm. which can, it just, it's a homework project. It, it'll fall on directors to mechanically pull, yeah, I saw 50 different drafts of this of, of this presentation or something. You have to get all of those drafts. It's just, it, it's a tax on M&A. Interlocking is another big issue. And just very, very quickly, there's a law, Section 8 of the Clayton Act, that says one person cannot simultaneously serve as a director of two competing companies. That makes perfect sense. They're then taking it a step farther and saying, well, if there's one common company that's appointing the two directors, so say a private equity company that has board seats on two different competitors' boards, and the same private equity firm can appoint one director to one company and one director to another company's board, even if it's different people, the FTC is saying that's a violation. And that that it's a problem. That's a real problem. I, I think they're wrong on the law, but that's the line they're taking. So pro tip for directors that aren't already doing this, uh, filing their emails uh, per company in, in, a, in a folder because yeah. uh, those emails may need to be uh, reported in a 4C uh, investigation for an M&A transaction. Pro tip number two, you've got to be thinking about the different boards you sit on and whether you're, those, those companies are competing with each other. And who would have thought that Amazon and iRobot would be viewed as competitors? And yet they are. Um, so that final tip for the audience. Um, I want to thank my panelists, uh, Ed and Deb, you are just wonderful. Again, uh, thank you so much for coming to us and sharing your story. It is compelling. And Ben, thank you for, for uh, sharing with us what's happening in, in Washington, D.C. I'm going to thank all, all of the attendees and uh, we will follow up with a, a blog post on those pro tips.